Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I am Brahim Audi. Anti-Asian racism. Uh, we have uh, three uh, guests to discuss uh, this topic. Uh, Mary Kunmei Yu Daniko, professor at Cal Poly Pomona. Thank you for taking the time to uh, come and uh, share your ideas about this important topic. Um, Monisha Dasgupta, professor of ethnic studies at uh, the University of Hawaii Manoa, also professor at uh, women's studies at the UH Manoa. And uh, Jonathan Okamura, professor emeritus of ethnic studies, Thank you both for coming to uh, discuss this uh, topic with us. Um, again, welcome uh, all, all uh, three of you uh, for that. So before uh, we start, I interviewed uh, Tai Tengan, who is the department chair of ethnic studies. And uh, we will uh, play his uh, segment um, from the interview. And then we open for a discussion. We, we see clearly these, these forms of oppression that the U.S. empire has brought to us, um, whether it be efforts to erase us as indigenous peoples in order to seize our lands, whether it is to create these kinds of foreign threats out of uh, the, the, the Asian menace, um, or it, it's to try to uh, create property out of bodies in terms of um, black folks and those histories that come with it. These are all interconnected. These are all what uphold white supremacy and empire. And it's important for us as, as Oevi, as indigenous peoples to link all of these struggles together. Um, the, the forms of colonialism, racism, xenophobia um, that, that operate um, in tandem and, and, and mutually support one and the other. So these are pressing matters for us because these are not how we as indigenous peoples relate to others in the world um, as well as, as the world itself. We have different forms of genealogical thinking and connecting that even during the time when we were first seeing the arrival of foreigners on shore on our shores we had different modes different ways of, of conceptualizing their presence different ways of welcoming but also challenging negotiations of whose land these this is but also how they can how others who are coming to it anew can can live here in in the right way in a pono way Mary, um, if I may call you so, you're my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, on that topic, how, how did that uh, really um, uh, take you by surprise or you were not surprised in terms of anti-Asian hate and uh, anti-Asian racism in the United States of North America? Yeah, I think in relation to the anti-Asian racism and hate, I can't say I was completely surprised. Um, I grew up in San Francisco in the Bay Area and as a child immigrant, as John knows, because John was on my dissertation committee, I was, I'm, I'm a 1.5 generation Korean immigrant who experienced quite a bit of racism and bullying, you know, early on. And so, you know, from spitting to shouting, racial epithets, um, just the daily microaggression that we experienced. So, that to me wasn't surprising. I think what was shocking, however, is the rise in the visceral attacks. And I have openly stated that this has a lot to do with the political social climate that, that was under the Trump era. But it was really, I think as Ty is inferring, is the whole colonial legacy of white supremacy that we continue to um, struggle with and fight against. And so I think the whole scarcity mindset of some more conservative Asian Americans is alarming with the anti-Asian hate of thinking that we have to kind of band together and protect ourselves when in reality, this is the best time to build coalitions and create a substantial substantive movement of black indigenous people of color to kind of address white supremacy and anti-racism and anti-fascism. Right. Uh, so um, before we go uh, to um, uh, our two other guests, uh, I want to play um, 
a segment from uh, Brian Chung, who teaches at uh, the Department of Ethnic Studies. And then uh, we we'll go, you know, we'll kind of discuss uh, this. And that this violence is connected to US forms of um, empire building and seeking to secure resources abroad and to sort of dominate and subjugate, um, you know, uh, post-colonial countries. And so I think, but, you know, not to make this completely academic, uh, you know, I think what's really great, not great, but I think what is very, um, that I've been thinking about a lot and trying not to get into this hole of despair is to, I think this is a moment for Asian Americans in the United States to really grapple with uh, forms of uh, violence, white supremacist violence against Asian American communities. Um, what does this mean for Asian Americans to politicize themselves? Um, and I think this is also a really great moment, not great moment, I don't wanna keep using this as like a celebratory moment, but I think that this is a really important moment um, in which Asian Americans are really trying to understand them, their experiences with racism in relationship to other communities, whether that's African Americans, um, Latinx communities, so on and so forth. And so, you know, I think it's the work that folks are doing um, across the United States, whether it's nonprofits or, you know, other sort of organizing spaces is, you know, that's been happening for a while, is having Asian American communities really understand, you know, anti-Blackness in this country and how, um, you know, in what ways is that related to the experiences of Asian Americans and what forms of state violence do Asian Americans face, if at all? Actually, uh, if you wouldn't mind, I'm thinking about it, that um, on the same topic, um, um, here's a segment from Ethan Caldwell, also teaches at the um, University of Hawaii Department of Ethnic Studies, and then we can open it up. And I think about this in the way that we have seen violence framed in the media, whether it's anti-Asian, anti-Black, and more. And I also, you know, then ask the question, too, of what violence do we allow? What violence is permissible in the country? And more so, why don't we treat violence in the same kind of regard that we treat other things in the country? And I think about this also because there's this, you know, violence becomes part of this longer legacy uh, in the United States that coincides not only with colonialism, white supremacy, but also the way that America maintains itself and its standing um, in one part to maintain power relations, dynamics, and control. But then also, it becomes another sort of venue, an avenue for folks to express the kind of discontent that they have um, between different groups, you know. And so one of the ways that we're, I'm thinking about this is also how in the media, many conversations about anti-Asian violence and racism, for example, have also been framed as Black Asian relations, you know. And that becomes this kind of misnomer, too, because, you know, if we stop to then think about, you know, the story, historic kind of nature between Black Asian relations, Oftentimes, we'll only see those negative events, whether it's the LA riots, whether it's Korean grocery owners in New York City and more. But then we also forget about the conditions that have created this kind of tension between communities. Why, for example, do Korean and other Asian groups get seen as these sort of middlemen minorities uh, when in relation to other black and brown communities of color? And then also, when we think about the kind of violence that occurs, why are we focusing on, you know, in some cases, black only against Asian or brown only against Asian. And part of that is also then to say, what is also being, how is that also still serving this large idea of white supremacy and control and power? But then on another note, this also then brings up this interesting kind of issue too of when we're thinking about what kind of violence is permissible, how is that still perpetuating the state? The kind of violence that is included in maintenance of the settler state in some cases, and also with the, you know, uh, which we call it, with white supremacy as part and parcel to this violence. And I think it, you know, behooves us to also then say, you know, what does the data say um, in regards to who is doing what, committing what kind of violence, but then also how legalized has that been since the Page Act, the Chinese Exclusion Act, and so many other laws and legal standings that have also expressed this discontent, often violently, against Asian communities in America, but then also what is that doing to the way that people then get to co-opt that power? John, um, you know, Ethan has um, um, in his segment uh, a number of uh, concepts, actually. And uh, one of those ideas uh, was the fact that, um, you know, what kind of violence is permissible, you know, 
you've written uh, a lot about uh, you know race and ethnicity and um, uh, inequality and the whole bit you know racism white uh, white uh, supremacy etc. So uh, what are your comments on uh, what we have uh, seen and your ideas also about what has been going on? Well, I'm not necessarily uh, in agreement that violence is permissible because uh, how do we stop that from happening? Um, what the, the media does certainly pick up on these acts of violence as extreme forms of racism, but racism, as we all know, is an everyday occurrence. It just doesn't get the media attention as it uh, enacts its oppression against people of color. But I think what I can follow up with all of our speakers is that in terms of what Brian said as a great moment, not necessarily a celebratory moment, is that it the anti-Asian uh, racism has demonstrated the complexity of race in America. So Ty brought out uh, this situation of Native peoples. Um, and uh, Ethan was talking about Black Asian violence. And in all the kinds of discussions regarding systemic racism that have uh, emerged since the killing of George Floyd, race and racism in America have been framed largely as a black-white issue. So if there's anything positive from anti-Asian violence, we can all see how race is far more complex than just the relations between blacks and whites. And it involves other very large categories or significant categories in American society such as Asian Americans, Latinos, and Native peoples. Yeah, that's, uh, thanks. And uh, Monisha, could you weigh in on um, all of that? Uh, thanks, Ibrahim. Uh, I'm gonna pick up on the theme of coalition building and solidarity across uh, racial groups and reflect on this moment as an opportunity to do that. So Mary brought that up, Ty did, you know, Ethan as well as Brian. Um, and, you know, I think that one of the most encouraging things for me has been that, um, you know, the conversation around abolition, which very broadly means freedom from all kinds of state oppression. And we also know that state oppression is not just the state, but also private public, you know, sort of cooperation, especially in terms of deportation. Um, so I feel like, you know, the, the level of conversation among activists, and I'm not just saying among academics, among activists who are doing work on the ground, you know, is really com com complex. And, you know, they are questioning, you know, whether more policing in the community, in Asian communities and Chinatowns is really going to address the systemic roots of that violence that John was referring to. So I feel very encouraged by the ways in which these, you know, analyses that are coming out of social movements are informing each other and we are building on each other. And you know, we do have a capacity to reject those old sort of Asian black tensions that came out from the LA uprisings. I mean, they keep circulating, you know, but they're old and they're not applicable. They were not even applicable then. So um, I feel that, you know, we, we, we are able to talk quite complexly about our realities and how they relate to other peoples who inhabit this ethno-colonial space. Yeah, um, and actually uh, what Mary uh, was talking about before, like what she had encountered when she was growing up and so forth. Uh, Laurel May Singh also teaches at the Department of Ethnic Studies at uh, UH Manoa, uh, has uh, this to say. I started to learn about the, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, um, the e eventual Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, which abolished racial barriers and immigration. Um, and that's actually around when my mother arrived to the United States from China was in 1954. Um, she moved to Bob Jones University in South Carolina. Her father was a professor there and the segregationist 
um, Senator Strom Thurmond passed a private resolution to enable my mother and her mother to migrate to the United States. So if you search my grandfather's name, Don Chen Chu, you can see that Strom Thurmond, you can find it on the internet, the private resolution that was written by Strom Thurmond. Um, so yeah, my parents kind of, or my mother came to the United States during this time of pretty, you know, anti-Asian racism in 1954 was still like a pretty heightened and kind of in your face thing. And then the year I was born was the year that Vincent Chin was killed. So this was 1982. Um, Vincent Chin was a, a 27 year old. Um, he was beaten to death in Michigan. And um, when these two white men killed him, they said, it's because of you that we're out of work. Right, so this kind of scapegoating of Asians for lack of jobs. This was in the auto industry at the time. They um, were blaming Japan for, you know, the loss of auto jobs. So our car, you know, manufacturing jobs, and Vincent Chen was obviously Chinese. Um, so they're, but they were scapegoating him because, you know, according to these murders, all Asians look alike. Right, so um, you know, anti-Asian racism has been very much a part of kind of the era in which I was born and raised. And I think I finally really got to experience it and live it, not necessarily live it directly, but live it in community through work I did with an organization in New York City called CAV, Organizing Asian Communities. Um, so it was formed in the 1980s in response to the killing of Vincent Chin and other forms of anti-Asian violence. Yeah, Mary. Um... Anything uh, that prompts uh, uh, you uh, to think about, um, you know, after listening to all these uh, segments and discussion? Yeah, I mean, I think you know what Monisha, John, and the speakers that you have have said also reminds me that we have this historical and cultural amnesia and er erasure of things that happen, and especially about coalition building. Even if you look at Vincent Chin's murder and Jesse Jackson at that time, really forming alliances with the Asian American community to speak against hate. And then, you know, even going back to some of our sheroes like Grace Lee Boggs and Yuri Kochiyama, who had incredible um, connection to their communities and forming Black Asian coalition or multi ethnic alliances. And, and I think when what we fail to recognize is that this, the coalition building is not new is just erased. And if you think about the Third World Liberation Front and the ethnic studies struggle and how we built community together to fight for you know, anti-racist work as a long going, you know, long um, legacy that I think many of us forgot about or they thought we lived in a post-era, post-racial America and thought everything was okay. And letting the guard down or in many ways just trying almost forgetting, you know, what the reality is, is that we still live in colonized, colonized land. We, we are um, still remnants and fighting against white supremacy in, this, in, in the island of Oahu, but also around the continent, around the world, around the globe. And then I wanted to bring up the issue of the policing that the model minority stereotype of anti-Asian um, hate has brought out as somehow, you know, these, you know, we're always pitted, right? Of, as Mia Tuan wrote, that we're either the honorary whites or forever foreigners. And depending on what happens, we tend to choose one or the other. And when we see communities getting attacked, they're calling for more policing, when in fact, we know that it doesn't work. We know that over-policing disproportionately affects Black health, Black lives. And what, what we are failing to recognize is looking at community-minded, um, community organized, community led initiatives that can help our, um, you know, com uh, friends and brothers and sisters of color. And so I think the, the policing, I have some data here from, you know, I think from 20, 1977 to 2017, state and local spending on policing increased from 42 billion to 115 billion. And when you think about this is in, um, I believe, in you know, just nationally, but they're looking at overall. And when you think about the hate against and racial pro profiling and increasing violence, it, it's we know that the policing stem from white supremacists and KKK trying to 
uh, grapple with, you know, freed slaves or trying to, I mean, it's just a long history of the police state and white supremacy. And so to infer that policing is what's going to help solve anti-Asian anti racism is a blatant lie. And I think folks have to really wake up and really call for justice and to continue to fight for coalition building and to find comrades. I think I shared with you, Brahim, on Facebook that just the other day in Kohala Mall, I was in there, I saw a black grandmother with her grandson being harassed by a security guard, an old white woman security guard, uh, just harassing her. And I had to go in and say, are you okay? You know, I think the Asian American Advancing Justice has this really great bystander training. And in hindsight, I didn't do everything that I went through the training with because I was so angry. But even on this island, you see incidents of microaggression. You know, maybe it's they're not beating them up. Maybe they're not spitting at them. Maybe they're not lynching them, right? But these microaggressive tendency of, of the entitlement to harass Black lives is a problem. And Asian Americans, benefit from the work and struggle of Black lives. And without the actions of the African-American communities and the Chicano indigenous communities, we would not be where we're at either. So we have to really understand our roots and give appreciation and fight. We need to continue to fight. Yeah, in fact, I'm glad you mentioned uh, that incident, um, you know, on the one you mentioned on Facebook. Uh, because I was going to follow up uh, on that with you, so <laughs> I'm glad you, you did that. Um, Monisha, um, any uh, ideas, uh, thinking about uh, what we have been talking about? Yeah, I, I just want to piggyback on, again, you know, our speakers who are here today uh, with us. I, you know, want to also say that uh, you know, talk as a South Asian Americanist and, you know, the, and, and also, you know, uh, when we, when this violence in Atlanta happened, you know, we talked about the ways in which, you know, people from West Asia, what is called the Middle East and South Asia have been relentlessly targeted. And, you know, there it was both visceral and verbal uh, that, uh, you know, those attacks. Um, and, you know, I, uh, Oak Creek was, of course, you know, a very traumatic event for us. This is where, you know, a white supremacist came into a place of worship and just gunned people down. It still scars us. And then again, you know, at the FedEx facility, I can't pronounce the name of that city, but in Indiana, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, these, the equivocation about whether these are hate crimes or you know, uh, that kind of stuff really, uh, talk, you know, speaks to the amnesia that uh, Mary is talking about, both about these attacks and then the very quick organizing around them and, you know, to shift the kind of discourse, you know, for our communities, it has been, you know, the for the South Asian communities, it has been, oh, you know, why were we mistaken as Muslims? Uh, you know, we are Sikhs and not so-and-so, you know? Like we really worked very hard within our communities to kind of show them what the you know problems with that kind of arguments you know are. So um, you know I feel that again like we have built a strong base. It's just like not popularized because the media doesn't want to hear that, right? The media wants to hear other stories about ourselves rather than the stories that we want to tell about ourselves. Yeah, that's uh, that's good. Before I go to uh, John, I want to um, uh, show this segment uh, uh, from Ethan Caldwell's uh, interview, and um, he's talking about the state again, back to the state, so to speak, and then we can open up. When we do start to think about the state as part of the, in some ways, like bartering partner with you know these kind of relations. You know, it also behooves us to then look at the ways that these different groups, especially, you know, Black, Indigenous, and uh, persons of color, both individually as well as communally, also subscribe to not only these institutions, but also the kind of messages that are present in these institutions that are aligned with the state, but also very much give them the power to then act, you know, through these violent means, and quite often unjustly, right? And so, for example, you know, we see this when it comes to 
voting, we see this when it comes to the presence of non-white folks um, also harboring that same kind of violence towards other groups of color and more. And, you know, you kind of have to sit back and say, but how is this really benefiting you? And why, if so, or if not, why does it still continue? You know, like even with my own work, when it comes to, you know, black folks who are in the military, you know, that's one of the main things that I'm asking in my manuscript, which is, you know, if you're in service of this military and you also recognize that it's also part of this larger imperial power structure, what interests are you actually serving and protecting? And if that becomes your only conduit to safety, which is alignment with this institution that's also causing violence, then does that make it okay that your, your safety is coming at the violence and genocide of somebody else? Yeah, I mean, uh, Mary spoke to something like, you know, <clears throat> oh, I am not, um, you know, or um, um, you know, Monisha too. Oh, I'm not uh, Muslim, I am Sikh, you know. <laughs> I mean, so <laughs> don't kill me, go kill the Muslim. <laughs> yeah, uh, here, uh, the same thing, like, you know, I remember um, like Samoans wanting to go to Iraq and kick A, you know, because they want to be part of the empire and all of that. Um, so, John, um, any um, thoughts about uh, those kind of things? Well, no, I was thinking about what Munisha said because, in a way, I've uh, framed or well, I've been thinking of the recent acts of anti Asian violence in the context of um, continuing racial blame pinning. So, uh, Lowell mentioned the killing of Vincent Chen in 1982 with the decline of the uh, Detroit um, auto industry. Well, we can go back earlier to the um, internment of Japanese Americans for the blame for the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And um, of course, 9-11, I, I think that's what uh, the issue that Manisha was kind of alluding to, uh, that the Sikhs were being blamed for, falsely of course, for the bombing of the World Trade Center because they were mistaken for Arabs, or at least the men are. And so in the same kind of way, because we're dealing with racists, there's no logic here, there's no reason in how they uh, make these kinds of false connections, accusations. Anti-Asian hate is a result of blaming Asians for the spread of the coronavirus. Um, and in terms of the state, I, I guess I would follow up with Manisha said, civil society, building coalitions as a way to challenge uh, the power of the state. I'm not joining the uh, U.S. military to go fight in Iraq. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, uh, that's good. Uh, Mary, um, anything on that? Uh... Yeah, just, I mean, I think I often quote, you know, Audre Lorde in, um, in her book, you know, Sister Outsider, you know, where she says the false notion that there is only a limited and particular amount of freedom that must be divided right, between us, as if um, instead of joining together to fight for more, we quarrel between ourselves. And I think as John mentioned with the internment, you know, during that time, very much like with the Sikhs are saying, I'm not Muslim, you know, I'm Sikh, or during that time, Koreans or other Asian Americans were bad just saying, I'm not Japanese. It is what I think Ethan pointed to, you know, Bonasich out of um, ideas of middleman minority, right, is that we tend to pit our communities against each other and instead of thinking that we're fighting for this freedom, when instead of really talking about anti-Asian, we should be stating white terrorism. I mean, we should be fighting to stop white terrorism. I mean, that's really the, the root of hate against you know, Black, Indigenous, and persons of color. And I think it is really important for us to get away from that scarcity mindset that I talked about, but really start to imagine a space where we can end white supremacy and neo-colonial and, you know, and begin to decolonize minds and decolonize our realities. And looking at the capitalist note, um, society that really pits community against and blinds us because of this capitalistic greed. And without empathy and kindness, and, you know, when we talk about empathy and kindness, it's so bizarre that people will say, oh, you're a communist or you're a socialist. Well, I said, well, if socialism and communism means you're kind and empathetic, then okay, that's fine with me. 
right? But as if somehow those things are horrible things to want. Um, you know, wanting folks to have health care, wanting folks to have shelter, housing, um, free from violence, free from fear, free education, as if those are horrible things, has a lot to do with a tremendous um, broken down system that is rooted in, you know, colonization, but really this capitalism that feeds the greed in this country. Yeah, like uh, decolonizing the mind is very important. So to wipe out the infrastructure, you know, to, as a step to get rid of this infrastructure of uh, white supremacy and all of that. Um, so uh, Laurel uh, May Singh has something to say about racial capitalism. Cedric Robinson has a fantastic book called Black Marxism, and he introduces and theorizes the concept of racial capitalism. So his argument is racism and racial differentiation is the ground through which capitalism develops, right? So we can see that you know, he traces us all the way back to antiquity and the rise of capitalism in Western Europe. Um, but we can trace it, you know, as you're saying, Brahim, to um, the rise of plantations and slavery within the United States, right? So the kind of differentiating of blacks from black people from white, um, you know, indentured servants to Native Americans, right? And kind of the genocide against Native Americans where there's also enslaved Native Americans as well as um, the slavery of black people, the slavery of white people, all the racial differentiation that um, was what enabled labor exploitation to occur, right? And these racial hierarchies shift and transform over time. So if we want to translate what we see happening in the United States, the continental United States to Hawaii, we can see similar racial differentiation happening on the plantations of Hawaii, right? Um, they, they had to divide the, you know, the Haole plantation owners from the Portuguese people who are often Lunas, kind of the middle managers, from the Japanese workers who often got paid more than the Filipino workers. And they all had their separate camps and the separate places they live. So that's what kind of perpetuated the flowing, the you know, the continuation of capitalism was the racial differentiation. Because if all these different groups, you know, the Portuguese, Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, et cetera, got together against the white plantation owners, they would have formed cooperatives and demanded living wages, and then the plantation owners would no longer be able to make a profit, right? So um, like, I've, like I said, racism is embedded in the capitalist system, right? It's the foundation of the capitalist system. And then I think what we're seeing happening today is kind of this intensification of anti-Asian racism because of the growing um, military and economic strategic importance of China. So that's the larger global um, you know, context. Uh, and so you would use uh, any kind of thing, uh, you know, the US state would use any kind of thing to beyond the Kung flu and all of that kind of stuff, but real policies, you know, state of the uh, Department of State policies, et cetera. So um, I wanna go to uh, Brian again, uh, because he gives uh, an example of racial differentiation here that is uh, really important. Uh, for us to reflect on. You know, in, in my class, I, you know, one of the things when we, when we look at anti-Chinese sentiment uh, historically in the 19th century was that this, uh, the desire that, you know, US indus white industrialists were seeking um, uh, cheapened labor, you know, in the aftermath of the emancipation of um, enslaved Africans in the United States. And what we see in that is the white working class backlash against Chinese laborers for uh, willingly taking these jobs um, and working for less. Um, and what we don't see, what I think has been critiqued or what the crit criticisms have shown is that, you know, white working class men in the United States, rather than challenge the industrialists, the, you know, these larger capitalist forces and institutions that said took it out on um, by racializing Chinese as you know the yellow peril. Uh, 
John, uh, any quick comment on that? Um, well, yeah, he's, I, I think he's referring to uh, re the recruitment of Chinese labor in the Mississippi Delta, such that over time that there was this very significant uh, Chinese American community that developed. Um, and under the segregated South, they're only, it's a two class system, either you're white or black. And so initially blacks were treated, sorry, Chinese Americans were treated as black. And so what they did uh, to emphasize difference, and this is what I guess Brian was bringing out is rather than saying forming coalitions with blacks, what they did was act white in different kinds of ways, um, becoming Christian for one. Um, moving out of black communities where they had their stores previously, or they had their stores, but they would live in the rear of their stores in these black communities. But with this movement in the 50s to escape that binary system of white and black only, to assert their not black identity, they moved out of the black communities. Uh, and, various kinds of ways to establish this difference. And over time, they were accepted to some degree as white. They could send their kids to the white schools. They could uh, ride at the front of the bus, uh, et cetera. So rather than the kind of coalition building, what we see is this emphasis on racial difference, which uh, for the larger system, this maintains the racial status quo. Yeah, right. Uh, before I go to Manisha, uh, uh, we were talking about like um, what can be done and the role of the individual, shall we say. We didn't mention it that way, but that's what we're talking about. Um, uh, so Ethan, uh, he talks about um, how he uh, tries to, um, you know, help out or uh, try to uh, be active uh, in uh, this uh, way my role especially when it comes to being in some ways affiliated with different communities you know japanese korean black folk um they are you know all kind of like the genealogies i claim i think it also provides me with a way to also try to build those connections you know between the various groups but then also to try to understand and even you know dispel many of the myths that do occur or misunderstandings you know whether it's you know, the way that there's, whether it's thinking about certain black perceptions about Asian, Asian Americans, but then also what that means from the other side. Why, for example, is there the sort of like anti-Asian sentiment, but then also the anti-black sentiment that's also very much, you know, present in Japanese and Korean communities. Even if it's as simple as speaking to one person about it, but then hoping that that conversation has a ripple to also encourage more understanding and fostering between the ways that, you know, those communities can come together under an alliance, you know, I feel like that becomes more of my role as the educator, you know, and also as a, you know, art, artist and creator. Uh, also, I want to play um, one from Laurel also about how do we make change? How to change that infrastructure. I am working with some really, really amazing people in Hawaii. And we just formed a couple of months ago, the Hawaii Abolition Collective. So our first actions have, were in front of the prison in Halava, where we were able to just kind of address the issue of the astronomical rates of COVID infections happening inside prisons, right? Because prisons themselves are a public health hazard. You know, when people, you know, I think the mainstream media is trying to scare us into thinking that it's the incarcerated people that's the public health hazard. No, it's the prisons that's making people sick, right? So how do we work with the infrastructures that are already there and support it? So one thing that we've been having conversations about is political education. So um, on Know Your Rights. So Monisha, um, your thoughts? Um, you know, I, I want to approach the question of capitalism and class of, you know, from the angle of, you know, um, what I do, which is, you know, the intersection of ethnic studies and feminist studies. And I think that, you know, the Atlanta shootings have made very clear uh, how, you know, sexualized labor of women um, are connected to military circuits and military imaginations. Uh, where, you know, the same sort of camp town ideas of, you know, dehumanizing these women, seeing them as seductresses or seeing them as completely, you know, and only living for, 
uh, the purpose of pleasuring people and you know also uh, being compliant. I mean, these ideas are, you know, I think that they are sedimented deep in Hawaii where we have so many military bases, right? And it gets sort of also expressed in our tourism industry. You know, I mean, these same ideas lead to the harassment of my students who work in the service economy. These same ideas lead to the harassment of the people who Local 5 organize. And, you know, they have organized around, you know, the tremendous sort of sexual harassment that, you know, people who work in these sites face every day. So, you know, I feel that the Atlanta uh, shootings uh, led to a conversation about, you know, openly conversing about women who are working class women who were in their 70s who still had to work in these circumstances. They worked without any, you know, break seven days a week. Um, and, you know, that was something else that I also learned through, you know, an organization that Laurel mentioned earlier, CAV, Coalition Against Anti-Asian Violence in New York City, as well as the work that the Taxi Workers Alliance did in New York, which is to always think about you know, um, economic impacts in conjunction with these kinds of racist, you know, racist attacks and, you know, um, anti-Muslim racism, right? That they're all combined together and they hit people, you know, in terms of their living, their ability to support their families, as well as, of course, the ways in which racism plays out. So, you know, we can't sort of de-link sort of gender violence from racism, from class oppression. Yeah, because the working class or, or actually the new class that is forming because of, um, you know, the development of capitalism and the technology, et cetera, includes um, men, women, uh, all kinds of gender uh, uh, issues uh, are important to take into, into account. Um, I uh, also interviewed um, Doris Ching, um, who's uh, Emerita Vice President for Student Affairs at uh, the University of Hawaii. And she and um, Amy, Amy Phil Akbayani published an article uh, that deals with those particular issues, uh, especially in terms of student affairs and education and all of that. And we started the research because we found that many of our faculty from other states were unfamiliar with local cultures which included how students, our local students, learn in the classroom and how they participate in the classroom. So we started to gather that information because we felt we needed to share that information with new faculty so that they can be informed and be able to help our students succeed, which was our primary goal in Student Affairs Administration, help students succeed. And of course, in that process, we want to see student affairs professionals, staff succeed, as well as faculty succeed. So that was our motivation to begin with. And we did use that research and that data to provide workshops for our faculty. Uh, there's another incident that was uh, later, much later than that. In fact, it was about in 1997, when I became the first uh, woman uh, of, of color and the first Asian American Pacific Islander to be elected president of a national organization for student affairs. It's the leading student affairs organization in the nation and the world. And amidst of, of the, all the congratulations that I was receiving at this national conference in Chicago, some young Asians came before me and said, Doris, you have to help us. We feel so isolated and discriminated against on our campuses. These were campuses primarily on the East Coast of the US. I was stunned because student affairs professional staff are tasked with nurturing students. And I thought, how can these staff nurture students when they themselves do not feel nurtured? So we quickly organized, Amy and I quickly organized this group of, and they were all young people young group of Asian Americans professional island, uh, and Pacific Islanders, they became such a force in that organization. They became prominent in their, in their roles because they were also capable and extremely enthusiastic because they finally had this opportunity to do something that they felt was important for their students and for their profession. 
they became prominent and they, they became leaders in that organization. And to, until today, they still are. They're holding prominent positions and doing very, very important work within the association. This article is timely. And what is sad about it is that uh, many of the information that we and research that we did 25 years or more ago, the same incidents, the same themes are actually continuing today, it, except I think it's much more violent today. And also, um, it, it you know, the perfect storm dealing with COVID and um, overt uh, attacks uh, because related to the uh, to um, the COVID, and also um, it uh, it's it's a lot more violent, and and it's all also national. Whereas a lot of the uh, survey, for example, the major AAP. I issues we conducted last year are the same. Um, discrimination, lack of representation in leadership positions, being a perpetual foreigner, uh, not Americans, lacking leadership skills, politically apathetic, anti-Black, and aligned with min whiteness and the model minority. So these same themes were there uh, for the last decades, but now it's uh, at least um, uh, I mean, unfortunately, it's become more violent and and but at the same time, I think the reaction of the Asian American Pacific Islander community, which in the past has not been as activist as I would have hoped, but there is a legacy of activism. Uh, they've decided not to take it anymore. <laughs> in addition to that, uh, I think um, uh, the the very horrible um, situation with um, the de the murder of, of, of uh, Black Americans and the Black um, Lives Matters movement has really uh, told us that there is a lot of inequality in America that we have to deal with and that Asian Americans are, 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 are the brunt of uh, some of this. The fourth point was um, the 2020 elections. Uh, people do not understand that there are over 11 million Asian American voters and that they, in 20 years, um, they grew by 139% in two decades. In contrast, the white population of voters grew by 7%. And so although it's a small community compared to the other larger groups, uh, it's a critical particularly in um, some uh, competitive states. And I think everyone understood stood that and they actually played an, a major role in the uh, winning uh, a democratic um, 50 senators uh, by electing two uh, senators in Georgia, you know, uh, and that's where the incident occurred. John, and you have experience with student affairs and all of that. Could you weigh in on uh, all of that? Well, I'll follow up with what Amy said in terms of um, the growing Asian American population. Uh, it's critical in certain states like California. For, for example, Asian Americans have outnumbered African Americans for decades already, I think from 1980. The African American population doesn't increase uh, significantly, well, in terms of percentage, it's roughly about 13%. The gains have been in terms of the Latino population and the African Asian American population because of, of immigration. And of course, naturalization results in this larger voting block. So uh, this isn't necessarily surprising. What, what is troubling is the rightward shift in some Asian American communities. Uh, who run as Republican and who get other Asian Americans to support them, uh, even in California, for example, or in Georgia, I believe, also. So we shouldn't uh, kind of assume that Asian Americans are necessarily going to vote Democratic uh, all the time. The Vietnamese American community, the strongest pro-Republican community in the Asian American, uh, among Asian Americans, that's a good point. And here, like immediate interests uh, figure out the, you know, 
uh, very much and this uh, which has a uh, connection to class as well. It doesn't mean that if you are a Democrat, you are not a uh, capitalist, <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, these immediate interests are very important and the history of the Vietnamese and who came here from the Vietnamese, etc. You didn't have like Viet Cong from here, etc. Yeah, so um, I want to play uh, one uh, more from Doris Ching, uh, and she talks about uh, also like, uh, in a way, coalition building and all that. We really feel that this, we need to come together as a community in solidarity and work um, across all ethnic groups in order to make a difference in the situation. And we feel that this, the time is now to do that. I might also add that, um, in our, uh, for our book, for, um, for the article, uh, we did send a survey out to uh, what we feel were people who were in prominent and leadership positions across the nation in various groups. And we received 17 responses from people, including Congresswomen, a Senator from Hawaii, uh, university presidents and emeritus university presidents, and we received uh, younger uh, faculty who are also are in leadership positions in the country. And we received um, uh, responses from all of these people, very, very um, responsible responses. One also was a, a general in the US Army, a retired general in the U U US Army. And these are all Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And we made it a point to show that all areas that we felt were um, should be included were all, were indeed included. Uh, in terms of the, the what's coming up, um, we will continue to do this, and um, we'll give an example. In Hawaii, a prominent community leader has asked us to participate in a project for an Asian American museum quality museum quality exhibit to emphasize that we are not perpetual foreigners. So this is kind of in the works. Uh, and again, I mentioned earlier that we have been invited to serve on panels, make presentations, and uh, we will just continue to do this. Um, we, we know uh, that we are long-term retirees, but we feel that this is important that we leave not only our profession and our campuses, but the entire community and the nation uh, in a better place than it is now. One last uh, thing uh, from Tai, and then we can have concluding remarks. Uh, Tai, um, he talked about uh, ethnic studies and what we do in ethnic studies and the methodologies that we pursue. Um, in our department, really take an intersectional analysis, looking at race, class, gender, sexuality, land, um, all together, and, and that, that's, that's really critical to develop that. Otherwise, one only sees it all oh, just as a matter of individual prejudice, as, as that's what racism is, rather than part of these broader systems. And in the, in the case of the, the murders in Atlanta, there's, okay, well, is it just a sexual kind of issue or, or gender and not racially biased? No, they're always intertwined. Um, and so... This needs to be part of the education, really, um, from K through 12. And, and there, there is, uh, or at least there was a bill introduced in this last legislative session to uh, try to require ethnic studies, um, I think, in the high schools. Um, I don't think it has gotten uh, too far, um, but, you know, these sorts of efforts um, follow efforts made elsewhere on the continent where this clear recognition of, of how, uh, you know, how ignorant most Americans are when it, when it comes to thinking about these longer histories of racism and how they're parts of these structures that are interconnected with other systems of oppression uh, needs to be addressed very early on. Um, Monisha, um, any uh, quick concluding remarks? I mean, not quick, like 30 seconds, but a little bit longer. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be respectful of time. Uh, I just wanted to sort of respond to uh, what Amy and Doris were saying, um, you know, to say that 
you know, the, the departments in which we work, ethnic studies or Asian American studies, you know, by definition, we are student centered and we support our students, especially at these, you know, moments where, you know, they really, that really impact them. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to highlight that there were a lot of really thoughtful and critical conversations at the AAAS, which is our association, the Asian American Studies Association, uh, about the ways in which the institutions feel like their job is done once they have made that statement, right? And so, you know, not only do the students need support, but the departments and the faculty who are doing this, you know, extremely necessary labor of supporting those students so that they can be successful. They can get through their four years, five years, seven years of college, you know, with the resources that they have. Uh, we, you know, there are these discussions about how institutions actually need to put money where their, you know, mouth is. So we need resources, we need that support. Uh, Mary, you had your stint as president of the uh, Association of Asian American Studies, and I know that you've done quite a bit uh, in that regard. So any comments on that? Well, I just wanted to piggyback on what John said earlier about, you know, just because we have the rise of Asian Americans and Latinos and Chicanos in California, for example, is the fastest growing immigrant population does not necessarily mean that they're more progressive or Democrat is sometimes actually on the contrary. But as John was speaking, I was, I'm, I'm thinking about kind of like what Monisha is talking about too, is the need for ethnic studies in K through 12 and college. And in California, there is a law for the CSU system where I work, where we have AB 1460, where ethnic studies is a required course. And I serve on the GE committee on our Senate committee, as well as the CSU wide um, committee looking at ethnic studies. And I think it lacks, it's not just that they're um, Asian immigrants, because I too am an Asian immigrant, or so my parents. It's not about the lack of consciousness about what it means to be Asian Americans, or, but it's really about the lack of education and going back to the fact that we don't tell the truth in our history making, right? We don't fill in all the gaps. And I think in Hawaii, I hope that we too here in Hawaii will have an ethnic studies mandate because this is the way you get people to wake up, you know, that there are woke Asian Americans and there are folks who are still sleeping and it's time to really wake people up. I think as AAAS, I think they, I unfortunately were not, was not able to go because I was doing a lot of Weglin series during that time. But as past president, I think one of the biggest challenges that we had was the BDS, um, supporting the BDS boycott. And I, for me, is we can't pick and choose which oppression that we get to fight. You know, it's like oppression's oppression, right? So if you think about um, the, you know, what's happening in Israel and with the Palestinian people and the occupation of the Palestinian people, and as well as when we talk about gender and um, sex, sexual violence and objectification of women, but also trans lives and GLBT. I think we can't pick and choose. It's not a buffet line. You're either anti-racist, anti-fascist, and anti-oppression. Hey, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, John, um, very quickly, like in 15 seconds, please. Uh, OK, we well, I, I'm um, assuming this is your last program of Iron Connections, if I'm not mistaken. So I, well, even, even if I am mistaken, I want to congratulate you and Erica for 20 years of broadcast. Uh, broadcast. Uh, I think I've been about on about 15 of them. So I, I've, uh, if I was there in person, as I told you, I'd give you a lay and also Erica. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, we shall see. Um, well, thank you all for um, doing this. It's very important, I think, um, this uh, uh, milieu, I mean, uh, this political social environment. And uh, mahalo nui loa for our viewers and hope to see you. Aloha, mahalo.